Welcome on this Halloween day. I welcome you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one God. We fulfill our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ by following our pathway, living our faith, nurturing families, serving our communities. Next Sunday, our clocks change. Daylight savings times end, and our clock, clock should be set back one hour. Also next Sunday, we will be celebrating All Saints Day. Uh, it's an opportunity to pay special tribute to those who have died during this past year and to remember all of our loved ones who are now enjoying life eternal with their creator. Community Cafe Meal will begin inside in Fellowship Hall next Sunday. This Sunday is the final cookout, and next Sunday we will be downstairs. There is still time to join or form a team. We will begin to collect blankets for the needy in November. Your donations will be distributed to the community through St. Vincent de Paul. And we will bless your blankets that you have gifted to that program on Sunday, November 21st. Let us now continue our worship together as we move to music. Stand and greet one another with the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. Yes. 
You know, last night I saw one of our kids come through the drive boo line last night because we used all of that candy you guys donated and we served 420, 450 children last night. Thank you for that donation. But as the kids were coming through the line last night, I said to one of them, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. And they looked at me kind of funny and I said, well, Sunday is church. And they went, but it's Halloween. <laughs> so... I want to share with you a little, a little Halloween thought. There is a great children's book out there. It's called The Pumpkin Patch Parable. But I'm going to give you, again, the Cliff Notes version because we'd be here quite a while. Pumpkin Patch Parable kind of tells us that being a Christian is a lot like being a pumpkin. You see, pumpkins come in all shapes and sizes. There's short, round, plump ones. And then there's tall, thin, long ones. And they all come in different places and different shapes. But the farmer, what the farmer does is the farmer will go out into his field and he will choose a pumpkin. Now, oftentimes those pumpkins, having grown in that field, will be covered in dirt and mud and dust. But the farmer, that loving farmer who planted and tended and cared for those pumpkins when they are come to harvest, he will pick one. He will wipe it off and clean off the dust and the dirt from the outside. And then, like many of you have helped your children, you will cut open that pumpkin, and there's a whole bunch of icky, gross, slimy stuff inside, right? We've all had to dig in there and pull it out. Well, you see, God, much like the farmer, reaches into our spirit and our heart and God digs out all of that icky, gross 
stuff in our lives that we call sin. And then as we take the pumpkin and we carve the new face, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, God gives us a new expression. God puts a smile on our face. And then, the last thing we do, we take a candle. Remember back in the old days when we used to take a candle and we would put it inside of that pumpkin that now has become something new and different, a jack-o'-lantern. And that candle will shine for all to see. You see, that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus takes us, he cleans us off, he takes all the ick and gross out of the inside of us, that sin that we might have. Jesus then gives us a new expression, a smile, and he puts his light inside of us. So today, as you leave this place, and as the children and I go upstairs, and we talk a little bit more about Halloween and what that might have to do with our faith, I hope and I pray that as you're out tonight and you see jack-o'-lanterns, you will remember what Christ has done for you and what Christ continues to do for those in our community. So kiddos, let's grab our stuff and let's head upstairs to godly play and to first kids.
us quiet our hearts and minds and go to God in prayer. Almighty God, the season we enter today was begun as an ancient tradition of marking the end of summer and the beginning of darkness and cold. Yet we know that in you there is no darkness at all. Your light of life is perpetual, never to be extinguished. When we are unable to see the way before us, it is then we are reminded to trust that you will guide and guard us by your love. God of laughter and joy, we ask for your protection and presence this night as we do every night. Keep all children safe as they enjoy child's play, protecting them from the evils that disguise themselves among us. May you, as the light of the world, shine in the dark night throughout the world and enfold your children, all your creation, in love. May all people come to recognize the real treat in their lives is your grace. A grace that we have come to celebrate as we offer praise to you with our lives. May your grace multiply in depth and breadth as the children grow older and all of us move to a closer relationship with you. In your wisdom, your continued, you continued to guide and guard our hearts through the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
this past week has been an average week, but your giving has touched many lives in the community for Christ. You hosted the Madison County Leadership Academy, hosted the Gateway Children's Halloween Parade, Bible studies, buddy bags, which reach over 400 children, drive boo, which reached 450 children, our daisy troop, many rehearsals, our bells, our choirs, alpha brass, Pilates class, an AA book club, an AA meeting, sewing group, Anderson Area Children's Choir and Youth Choirs. Many ways that lives have been reached by you. Let us praise God for God's wisdom and provision. Let us pray. We praise you, O oh God, for this church which is a beacon in this community of a place where you are shared. You can be known, and most of all, where your love comes alive. Bless the gifts that have been given to continue sharing your good news. Amen. Please stand for the reading of today's Gospel lesson and Old Testament lesson. Our Gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Our Old Testament lesson is from Ruth, chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Then all the people who were at the gate, along with the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. This is God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. I had to go a long way back, to 1961, in fact, when I was in Mrs. Ross's third grade class in Atwater, California. I had to go that far back to remember the time that I first noticed or that I gave any real thought to the fact that there were people in the world who were not like me. Now, I had lived in Guyana and Trinidad in the Caribbean just before coming to California. And in those places, I was in the minority. I was Caucasian, and the people all around me were brown and black. I should have noticed it then, 
And at some level, I suppose I did, I was amazed, for example, that the women ironed their hair after rubbing all sorts of hair lotions into it. The lotion was gooey and sticky and had this unique odor when they ran that hot iron over their hair. But I never thought of them as so strange that I looked down on them or that I didn't want to be around them or that I didn't trust them or that I was afraid of them. Nothing like that. They just had different hair than I did. Neither was I treated as the other. At least, I never felt excluded or belittled or ashamed. But then I was white, and the white missionary with money and power was in charge of the school, and the British government was in charge of the country. So regardless of their feelings, a certain deference would have been expected. But then came third grade. I think it worth noting that after all these years, I still remember her name. Her name was Martha, Martha Aguirre. I remember her being very tall and very thin. She wore the same dress to school every day. Her fingernails were broken and dirty. Her hair was stringy and unwashed. She smelled badly. Martha didn't speak English very well. Her native language was Spanish, but we didn't speak Spanish in the classroom, so she didn't talk very much. She kept to herself at recess and at lunch. Martha never got any of her work posted on the bulletin boards, and the kids laughed at her. They laughed at the girl who lived in the camp for migrant farm workers in a cabin that had no indoor toilet, no running water, and no heat or air conditioning, not even a swamp cooler. And I, well, I laughed at her too. And when you had to sit behind, beside her or stand beside her, everyone said you had cooties because she was a cootie. And I didn't say that out loud, but I didn't want to stand beside Martha either. She wasn't at our school when Mrs. Freeman became my teacher in the fourth grade. I suppose her family had moved on to another farming community and to yet another migrant cab worker cabin. I wonder whatever happened to Martha. Of course, we would be the same age today. I wonder if she's even alive. And if she is, does she have any inkling that someone back in the third grade still remembers her and wishes now she had chosen a different path? path of kindness and a path of friendship. This is just one childhood example of what seems to be at the root of so much enmity and hate and conflict and pain that has plagued our world down through the ages. In those ancient days, people became scattered across the face of the earth and new languages were created. People didn't understand each other anymore. Groups of people developed differently, their way of life, their cultures, their understanding of God or gods and their relationship to those gods or to the one God. Priorities became different Values became different, and the threat to one's way of life became altogether real. Communities feared change. And so those others became offensive, the threat personified. Differences became a matter of right and wrong. Those others 
The ones not like us were now despised, feared, at best ignored, at worst treated as less than human. No one wants to lose control of their own life, to give in or to give up anything, certainly not for the sake of this other. We live in this us-them mentality with increasing concern today, and we call it the refugee problem and the migrant problem. We call it the threat of communism, the threat of the Taliban. We call it the problem of racism or poverty or terrorism. We call it radical Islam or the far-right extremism. We call it the Democrats and the Republicans, but it's all the same. It's the other. Those who are offensive to us for whatever reason and those for, from whom we perceive a threat. It was no different for the people and the cultures we encounter in the Bible. There is an interesting and ongoing debate among God's people in the Old Testament about what to think and how to treat and how to live with the other in their world. To be honest, the Old Testament story of God's people is conflicted about this very thing. God's people were chosen. They were set apart to be holy, even as God is holy, and to be wholly distinct from all others. They had laws that informed them of how they were to live in relationship to the other in their midst. But sometimes these laws seemed very much in conflict with each other. In Deuteronomy 23, Mosaic law states that because the Moabites, the Moabites failed to lend aid to the people of God as they wandered about those 40 years in the wilderness, God's people were never to promote the welfare or the prosperity of the Moabites for as long as they lived. They were never to promote the welfare or, of, of, or the prosperity of the Moabites as long as they lived. And speaking of non-Hebrew people in general, it's further written in Deuteronomy 7, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn you, your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. Now compare those laws with these. Deuteronomy 14, in Deuteronomy 10, we read, And you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And from Ezekiel 47, you are to allot land as an inheritance for yourselves and for the foreigners residing among you who have children. And get this, you are to consider them as native-born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Wow. Wow. Other Mosaic laws demand justice for the foreigner. You see the dilemma. Which law supersedes the other? And then we have the book of Ruth, which places both sides of this dilemma in stark contrast, but also perhaps suggests something to us of the heart of God. You're familiar with the story of Ruth, which begins, of course, with the story of Naomi and her husband, Elimelech. There was a famine in the land of Judah at the time of the judges, and Elimelech decides to leave his homeland and travel with his wife and two sons into Moabite country. You can imagine their desperation 
to make such a move. The Moabites were the despised other. Elimelech dies while they are in Moabite territory, and their two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, marry Moabite women. Before any children are born, both sons also die. Now, I have heard sermons preached which suggested that the deaths of these three Hebrew men was in punishment for breaking the law of Moses by dealing with the Moabites and intermarrying with them. Naomi's cry, the Lord has turned against me. The Lord has dealt harshly with me and brought calamity upon me suggests that she indeed may have believed the same thing. Yet against her protestations, Ruth, one of her daughters-in-law, chooses to remain with Naomi when after 10 years in Moab, Judah is finally fruitful again, and Naomi decides to return home as a very vulnerable and destitute widow. Ruth speaks those words most familiar to us. Do not press me to leave you or to forsake you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. And so they return to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And this is where Ruth's story and, and Israel's story take an unexpected turn. In doing what she can, according to the law and custom of the time, Ruth catches the eye of Boaz while gleaning barley left by the reapers as they harvest the fields. Now, Boaz was a wealthy landowner and farmer who just happened to be a close relative of Elimelech, Ruth's deceased father-in-law. He was also, by the way, a descendant of Tamar and Judah, a scandalous union, to say the least. Boaz honored Ruth, a Moabite woman, with special favor, and when Naomi discovered who was helping them, she devised a plan that ultimately resulted in the marriage of Boaz and Ruth. Boaz honored family tradition and obeyed the law by becoming a kinsman redeemer, marrying Ruth and giving Elimelech a son through Ruth to carry on the family name. And so we come to the passage that Kathy read for us this morning. Boaz announces his intentions toward Ruth at the city gates. And the elders of the city, these traditional law-abiding Hebrews, blessed the union between Boaz and a Moabite woman. They said, may you produce children and bestow a name in Bethlehem and through your children that the Lord will give you by this young woman. May your house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah. And for the first time in the story of Ruth, God takes direct action. Scripture says, and when they came together, the Lord made Ruth conceive. She bore a son. And you know the rest of the story. That son was Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And centuries later, Jesus was born, Messiah, Redeemer, Savior in the line of King David. Saved by whom? The other? Ruth, the Moabite other, acted in loving kindness and communicated God's love and presence to Naomi. Ruth became the human catalyst for Naomi's redemption and ultimately the redemption of all Israel, the redemption of all humankind. 
We who think we have been chosen by God are often tempted to exclude those we see as the other. But God often chooses the other to help carry out his purposes in the world. Well, despite the implications of this story of Ruth that's so deeply embedded in the religious life and tradition of the Israelites, their problem with the other continued down through the centuries. You'd think that being oppressed in their own land during the Roman occupation, that they might have a little bit more understanding, a bit, and to be a bit more open and gracious toward the other. But no, the problem of the other was still a problem. So one day, Jesus takes advantage of the opportunity presented to him by a lawyer wanting to test Jesus' ability to debate the law. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer asks. Well, that was simple. Jesus replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Well, the lawyer then, who really wants to know the limits of his neighborliness, who is worthy of his love and who is not, says, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells that familiar story we refer to as the Good Samaritan. You know, I have always assumed that the man beaten by robbers and left half dead in the ditch between Jerusalem and Jericho was unconscious throughout the entire story. I don't know about you. That's the way it always has seemed to me. Jesus doesn't say he was or he wasn't. But I wonder if lying there, the man heard the approaching footsteps of the priest coming down the road and wondered if the robbers were coming to get him, finish him off, or if, he, if it was someone who just might help him. Maybe the man peered through his swollen eyes just enough to see that it was a priest who glanced his way and then crossed to the other side of the road and quickly hurried away. I wonder how much hope the injured man had left when yet another, this time a Levite, passed by and offered no help. Then more footsteps, this time of both man and donkey. I wonder if the man in the ditch with the sun beating down on him, holding on to life by a thread, opened his eyes to see the man coming toward him, no, he thinks, no, not a Samaritan. I'd rather die than be saved by a Samaritan. But of course, it was a Samaritan in Jesus' story. Who stops, risks his life, tears up his clothes, and binds the man's wounds and takes him to an inn to let him rest and recover. And then... In an extravagant gesture of goodwill, he promises to return and pay the innkeeper whatever else he spends in caring for the injured man. Now, when Jesus finishes his surprising story, he turns to the lawyer and asks, which of these three was the neighbor? And the lawyer must have been confused in that moment. That wasn't the question he had asked. The lawyer had asked, who was it that was his neighbor, whom he should love as he loved himself? And Jesus turned the question around, which of the strangers, which of the three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the wounded man in the ditch? In other words, which of these three should the wounded man love as much as he loves himself. Not to whom shall I be a neighbor, but who is a neighbor 
to me. No, the lawyer likely thought, I'd rather die than be saved by the likes of a Samaritan. So it was probably a very reluctant response when he said to Jesus, well, I suppose it was the one who showed compassion. William Willimon suggests that this is a parable about a strange God we don't expect. A God who saves us through people we can't stand. A God who chooses to save us through the despised other. Saved by whom? The offensive other? The Samaritan acted in loving kindness and communicated God's love and presence to the wounded man. It was a Samaritan who became the human catalyst for a beaten and dying man's healing and wholeness. We who think we have been chosen by God are often tempted to exclude those we see as the other. But God, God often chooses the other to help carry out his purposes in the world. What comes to my mind in this moment is the sulking prophet Jonah, who after being stopped in his runaway tracks by a big fish that swallowed him, and then after three days and nights spat him out onto dry land, this prophet Jonah finally warned the hated Ninevites of God's impending judgment. And at the end of the story, we find him sulking because the Ninevites actually repented and God actually forgave them. You're our God, not theirs, Jonah seems to be saying, as God gently but pointedly rebukes him. And so Jonah's story ends unresolved with Jonah in need of his own redemption, sitting in the blazing sun wishing he could die because he is not open to God's forgiveness on his behalf through the Ninevite other. I'd rather die than be saved by the likes of them. God often uses the other to carry out his purposes in the world. Who is your other? Might God use such a one to bring about our own redemption? Our own healing and wholeness in this fractured and broken world? Let us pray. O oh, loving God, you who will go to any lengths to redeem us, to heal us, and to make us whole, help us. Help us risk opening ourselves up to being loved and rescued and cared for by those who are not like us, who might even be offensive to us, Help us to be open to the truth that they might, in fact, have something to teach us about you. And in so doing, might we truly know what it is to love you with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. Amen.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.